Hello, everybody. That's my dog. Hello, everybody. This is Andrea Medina. I am uh, the state co-chair uh, of the Green Party of Colorado. Um, we have on the line with us today Bill Kremel, who is one of our five candidates, our Green Party candidates for president. Um, and, and as you may realize, we're going to be selecting a nominee as a national party in Houston in August. The Colorado State meeting, though, for delegate selection and our, our preference is going to be on April 3rd. And so these, this series is as a way to help Colorado Greens figure out who's on board, what they have to say, and what they think about things that have to do with Colorado. There's a lot of national issues here, too, as well. And so as I said, on the line here, we have Bill Kremel, um, long, long-standing Green, um, one of our resident academians on political science and things of that nature. He's a professor emeritus from the University of South Carolina. Uh, he holds a doctorate from Indiana University. Uh, a JD from Northwestern. This is an extremely learned individual, an author of several books. Um, he's from Sar South Carolina and very active in the South Carolina Green Party. Um, let me go ahead and let Bill take it away. Uh, doctor, sir, tell us some more about you. <laughs> You're overwhelming me here, Andrea. Thank you for that kind of introduction. And I just want to say a few words to get started. First of all, I fully understand that Jill Stein is going to be our candidate, and I'm thrilled, okay? Let me just say, as a little matter of background, I spent $5,500 on Jill last year uh, doing two videos and having those videos run in all three of our metropolitan districts here in South Carolina. Only three of the Confederate states beat the, the percentage that I was able to get here in South Carolina for her. Um, I also got signatures for her up in Illinois. I think I was the fifth, uh, uh, fifth largest signature gatherer. Uh, when she was here in South Carolina, she needed a place to stay overnight. She stayed with us, and we got to know her real well. She's a wonderful person. I really respect what she's doing. And the only reason I'm involved in this is because there's an issue or two that she's choosing not to touch on which is her want. I mean, she's entitled to run on what she wants to run on, and she's doing a wonderful job with the issues that she is dealing with. Um, I am interested in some slightly different things, and we'll, we'll certainly get into that. Um, but the point is, I support Jill, and what I'm asking uh, uh, many states to do is to think about giving me a single delegate. Because the kinds of changes that I'm talking about are constitutional and something that, uh, that during the hour I'll have an opportunity to talk about. Um, our government doesn't work. I don't think that's a big surprise. But I have been involved both as an academic, uh, r researching, writing, uh, giving speeches, writing essays, um, uh, that kind of thing, running for office several times talking about the American political system and why it is failing us and why we need to do some fundamental, that is, constitutional changes. So that's why I'm here, okay? And that's something that Jill isn't dealing with, which is fine. Um, you know, it's a nice, uh, nice uh, division of labor, really. Um, I also may say a word or two about what I think is a coming ideology, but that's going to be very brief. Uh, so that's what I'm doing, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come uh, uh, to uh, to uh, Colorado uh, through this uh, this uh, meeting. I, um, I I love Colorado. I remember as a little kid, my father took me out to Denver, and then we went up to the mountains. It was just a very very pretty place. Well, of course, we're in love with Colorado too. So thank you for that. You know, what's it's really interesting that the the tack you're taking. Uh, one of the questions that was asked by some of our folks uh, that are uh, submitting questions uh, was, was you know, centered around the tenor of the debate that we see in the duopoly parties right now. And certainly your, your, your attitude is a lot more collaborative than what we've seen. Um, assuming that you become president, uh, what would you do to change the level of discourse, the, the probably acerbic nature of the discourse that we're seeing um, in Washington these days? Let me say this, um, the fact that we have the kind of polarization and the kind of rancor that we are now seeing should not be a surprise because part of the reason for it is that the government has not been able 
to deal with issues that have now hung on for years, in some cases, decades. And so people are frustrated. Uh, why didn't we do something uh, when the corporations were offshoring jobs, when they were outsourcing, when they were engaging in, in what's called corporate inversions in which they go over to Ireland like Pfizer is doing and so forth. They're hollowing us out, okay? Let's be really clear about this. I wrote a book, and I'm going to show you this. We'll just take a second. In 1979, it was called The Middle Class Burden, okay? The middle class was doing really well then, but I saw things that I thought were very perilous. And I thought that this uh, might be the beginning of a hollowing out of the middle class. I uh, was honored to have a pre-publication review by John Kenneth Galbraith, all right, the great economist from Harvard. I dedicated the book to John Kenneth Galbraith. You can see that. And he and I became pretty good friends. And he agreed with me that there was something going on that wasn't going to be very good. Well, to make a long story short, 18 years later, I wrote a book called America's Middle Class from subsidy to, to abandonment, because that's what happened. The kinds of subsidies that the middle class were getting were slowly withdrawn. And so what happened? Well, okay, you know, the middle class did lose it. And that book has been cited in many places. I'll just show you one. Here's a book called The Fragile Middle Class that was written after my book, one of the authors being Professor Warren from the Harvard Law School. I don't know what happened to her. She kind of went bad and got involved with the government, but somehow. But when she was a professor, she cited me three times in her footnotes and said, you know, this is a book that we learn from to write her book. It was foreseeable. It was preventable. Uh, and I'm angry that people like myself, academics, and let me say something here. I mean, this, this is something that I've been, been upset about for a long time. If you go to Europe, there's a great respect for academic work. And people who are professors at universities are at least listened to. It doesn't mean you agree with them, but they're taken seriously. There's a real anti-intellectualism to American politics. Obviously, someone like Trump, you know, is, is a gold star uh, member of that. But that's been going on for a long time. I'm old enough to remember Adlai Stevenson. He lost to Eisenhower. Obviously, Eisenhower was very popular, the war general and all that kind of thing. But the Republicans painted him as an egghead and said he was an intellectual. He'd gone to Princeton and some of his speeches were rather flowery and they were attempting to be Churchillian and, you know, this kind of thing. And so, you know, Americans don't like that. Um, and so it's very hard as an academic, even if you're doing serious research, being published by good publishers, being cited by good people, you know, still an awful lot of the uh, practitioners and I'm not talking about just the office holders, but certainly the office holders, the office seekers, the party people, certainly the campaign industry. Don't forget them. They're very influential. The campaign industry itself, they don't want to hear from a college professor. They really don't want to be any deeper than their 30-second spots can deal with, you know. And that's why we have the kind of uh, really not very intelligent conversation. It didn't begin with 2016. We've had a lot of campaigns. Uh, the fact that, uh, that John McCain could have chosen someone like Sarah Palin, I mean, that kind of thing. But if you go back even before that, George W. Bush. I mean, what did he say? Even if you if you agreed with him, did he say anything of any moment, of any real importance, any depth? No. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And, um, you know, I'm very honored to be out here. And again, that's the reason I'm doing this. I'm an academic. I graduated from Northwestern Law School in 1965. I've been in the academy over 50 years. Late last week, I gave two lectures down at the College of Charleston, or two classes down there. And I've, I've done that. I'm still, I'm going around to schools, but also to various green parties. Well, great. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, I, I guess the way, the, the brass tacks of how this government works um, in terms of 
well, you know, we, we've got these issues with, with campaign finance. Um, you, you know, we've got an organization that really is kind of like a sister organization to our party, and that's moved to amend. Mm -hmm. talk, talk to me a little bit about uh, campaign finance, about uh, constitutional amendments, about um, it, what can we do to kind of straighten this out a little? Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful question. In late 1979, I began to say that the government wasn't working. Some of it was Jimmy Carter, who didn't get along with the legislature very well, but it wasn't all Jimmy Carter. And so I did something very bold. I suffered from a slight speech handicap. And when I taught classes, it was pretty, pretty good. But public speaking was something I had never done. So I went to a speech therapist and paid some, some pretty good money. And I entered the 1980 Senate Democratic primary here in South Carolina. Now, there wasn't any way that someone from Chicago with a Slavic name was going to beat Fritz Hollings. But what I did was call for a constitutional, uh, constitutional commission at the bicentennial of the Constitution. This is 1980. The bicentennial would be 1987. So I said, we need to look at our system. Let's use this anniversary and look at why things aren't working. I was very fortunate. The TRB column, I know I'm holding up a bunch of stuff here, but the TRB column of the New Republic, which was the principal political organ of its day, covered me. I was covered by the Christian Science Monitor. There was something in the Washington Post, and so forth and so forth. And we were able to gather a group of people, to get back to your question, who wanted to answer things like, why doesn't the government work and what kind of changes can we bring about? I also, in 1984, took leave without pay also, did some more speech therapy, and went up to New England and some other states held forums, people like Lester Thoreau from MIT, James McGregor Burns came down from, uh, from uh, Williams College, and so forth. Um, and I held forums all over New England and in and a couple of other states talking about what we needed to do. And that was a further momentum to uh, a, a group called the Committee on the Constitutional System chaired by Lloyd Cutler, counsel to the president in the Clinton, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Clinton presidency. Uh, C. Douglas Dillon uh, was one of, the, uh, one of the board members who was in both the Eisenhower cabinet and the, uh, the John Kennedy cabinet. Uh, Nancy Casabon, the senator from Kansas. And then academics like James McGregor Burns, people like Bill Fulbright, some of you who remember how valiantly he fought against the Vietnam War. He was one of our people. There were a number of wonderful A-list people in that group, and I helped found that group. And we brought this report personally to the President of the United States. Lloyd Cutler met with the President and handed this report. This is what we must do to fix things. Front page coverage in the New York Times. Front page coverage in the Washington Post. I've been at this for a very long time. I always ask my audiences one question. What was the response of the Republican and the Democratic uh, parties to the recommendations of CCS? And then there's a silence. And then I congratulate them. I say, you're right. It was utter silence. Neither the Republicans or Democrats would touch it. They wouldn't touch it. And so the situation simply got worse and worse and worse. Now, okay, you want me to get to some specifics. Here are some of the things that we're fighting. All right, in other words, here's the diagnosis of, of the problem. No country in the world has a set of institutions and a set of processes that is more centrifugal than ours. We all understand centrifugal and centripetal, okay? We have separation of powers, okay? We have federalism, okay? National government, states governments, okay? We have true bicameralism, okay? Two co-equal houses of our legislature, 
Most countries don't have that, okay? We have staggered elections. That was done as a very anti-majoritarian strategy so that you, the people could never elect the whole government and go in one ideological direction or, or the other. And finally, and this is something that people don't understand, and I hope to help, uh, help people understand this, we not only have separation of powers, but we have separation of people, which means that if you're in the cabinet, let's say, you cannot serve in, in the Congress. That's been an issue that has been talked about for years. Woodrow Wilson wrote about it in 1879 and suggested that cabinet members should be members of the Senate so that there's some bridge here, okay? Well, you put those five things together that I just listed, and you have a government that is designed not to work, and it doesn't work. And if you read James Madison's number 10 Federalist, it's very clear. He didn't want majorities to aggregate. They were concerned about what they called factions, which was kind of pre-political parties. They didn't want the public involved. This was a document of landed, propertied white males for propertied white males. And they always considered that an elite would run the system. And we still have that as our constitution. And, you know, once again, it shouldn't be a surprise that we have research from places like Princeton, Northwestern University, other, other good research, that we are no longer a constitutional democracy. How sad is that? We are an oligarchy. It goes back to Aristotle. It's an aristocracy gone bad, an aristocracy that only feeds itself. And the correct word, and it's finally being used now, is oligarchy. Once again, foreseeable and preventable. But we didn't do either, and so that's what we're stuck with. And we're fighting the Kochs, and we're fighting the Scaifes, and we're fighting uh, Sheldon Adelson, uh, you know, our country has been bought. It's been bought by a very small handful of people. And um, I see where one of the Walmart uh, daughters, let's, let's not leave the women out here, uh, one of the Walmart daughters just gave a third of a million dollars to Hillary. Um, so, you know, <laughs> uh, that's really where it is now. And it's a very, very sad thing. No. Well, you know, I, I have to, if I could just kind of add this, you know, the, the this kind of a situation and the influx of money and that sort of thing, um, you know, people are, are really starting to have a lot of dialogue over, but the part that people don't really be, they don't seem to be able to, to, to zero in on is the why. Why would we as a country sit on our hands um, and, and just not do anything to reform any of this. Well, some of what happened was inadvertent in the sense that it wasn't anybody's specific fault. You had the coming of TV. That's a very important thing. There's always been money in politics. We know Tammany Hall. There were accusations about James Quincy, Adam, John Quincy Adams, you know, all that kind of business. Um, but what happened with television is there was an explosion of a need for money. But also, and this is very important, there have been some outrageously bad Supreme Court judgments, opinions. It didn't start with, uh, with uh, Citizens United, okay? It started many years ago with a, uh, a case in which the opinion was written by Lewis Powell. Some of you will remember reading about Lewis Powell. He wrote the memorandum. It's known as the Lewis Powell Memorandum, ostensibly for the Chamber of Commerce, but it was used principally by Nixon and Pat Buchanan and those people to take the country back from the lefties who they thought had taken the country over in the 1960s. All right. That was Lewis Powell. Virginia aristocracy, FFV, you know, first families and all that. Guess who got appointed to the Supreme Court. Oh, Lewis Powell. And that memorandum, which was written in 1971, starts to be put into effect 
in the Buckley versus Vallejo case of 1976, just five years later. The opinion was written by Lewis Powell, okay? And it was, it was a crack in the door, the camel's nose under the tent, in which Powell made the utterly specious distinction between contributions and expenditures and said, well, the Congress can legislate on contributions, but not on expenditures. So if you had independent expenditures where I don't talk to you as, as the candidate, okay, I can spend all I want, okay? Or the candidate himself or herself can spend all he or she wants. That was the crack in the door. There were a number of other cases. And finally, Citizens United 2010, which just completely blew the doors off, off the hinges. And now the flood has, has started. Um, that's part of the reason too. So, I mean, these kinds of things happened. The public had a sense of it, but there was a momentum to it. And let's be honest, the elites wanted that. Okay. You know, that's the answer to your question really is that there were people in this country who really wanted this to take place. They were behind people like Lewis Powell. They were behind people like Ronald Reagan. What did Ronald Reagan do? I mean, my goodness, as soon as he became president, the 1981 tax cut greatly favored the rich. And then people said, you know, Ronnie, we're running these terrible deficits. And you know what Ronnie said? He said, you're, you're right. So what did he do? He raised the uh, tax on workers, the social security tax, okay? That was raised to make up the deficit. Well, of course that was highly regressive okay so you know he screwed us twice within two years uh those are the kinds of things that have happened There's more to it but those are three at least to answer your question as to how we got here so it sounds really the impetus is a consolidation of power by people who already had it is that a summary it's it's by a consolidation of power people who had it and who wanted the kind of system where only certain people really were important. And they saw themselves in part, but also people of like mind. Um, you know, it's the old battle between democracy and aristocracy. I, I, you know, I spend a lot of time with students and with people I talk to. I say, read the Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Address. What does the Gettysburg uh, Address speak to? It doesn't speak to the North and South. You won't see anything about the North and South in there. The whole idea is our founders founded a new nation. Remember that? What he meant was a new kind of nation. It wasn't like England or France or Spain. Those were aristocracies, mostly monarchies also. No, we had a new kind of nation. And then at the end, the final words of the Gettysburg Address, this wonderful thing, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. In other words, Lincoln, more than anything, remember he was born as a Southerner, okay? And saw himself as a Southerner and saw himself as liberating not just the slaves, which he wasn't really interested in at, at the start of the Civil War, but liberating the white uh, workers, the sharecroppers, um, the uh, tenant farmers, uh, the people who worked as, as laborers in the South for ridiculously low wages. That's who he was concerned with. And so the battle between the aristocracy and, and small d democracy has gone on since the Constitution, through the Civil War, and now we've got it again. And what happened is that the elites kind of did an end run around us. And it, again, it was money, it was television, it was the Supreme Court, it was the fact that the Republican Party completely lost all of its bearings. It kicked out the Nelson Rockefellers and, and Jacob Javits and Chuck Percy's and those kinds of people. They were gone. They didn't want anything to do. I always, I always laugh because I say, you know, the last liberal Republican was Lincoln Chafee, okay? And he was the last follower of Abraham Lincoln in the Republican Party. Wow, that's fascinating. So, okay, the office of the president on this issue, what can they impact? 
what can we do about it? Is that what you're asking? Um, as as the president, the office yeah. of the president, what sort of impact does the office of the president have on this situation? I think that there are at least four constitutional amendments that are absolutely mandatory. The first obviously deals with the Citizens United case. I thank uh, David Cobb for his great work. I made a couple of speeches myself down in Florida. Um, we have got to overturn this and return the electoral process to the people. Okay. There are a number of sub-constitutional things we can do, like repass the 1965 Voting Rights Act, because you know what the Supreme Court did is to chop off a good bit of that and get rid of these IDs and what happened in Jacksonville in 2000, where thousands of African Americans were thrown off of the voting rolls, things of, of that kind. So that's one thing that, that we actually have to, absolutely have to do. The Electoral College, talk about an antique. I mean, this, <laughs> we've got to get rid of the Electoral College, have everybody's vote count the same, whether you're from Nome, Alaska or Key West, Florida, I don't care. That's what we should have, one big voting and instant, instant runoff voting so people can have a first choice, second choice, so forth. I mean, you know, that is absolutely mandatory. There are two others that I will just very quickly touch on. We should have a four-year term for the House. This is an old idea, and it's one of the recommendations that we gave to the president um, to have the members of the House not have to run for re-election as soon as they get into office. They've got to They've got to start making phone calls. And you know what happens in the off years. The other side always wins. So the third and fourth years really don't count. And um, we just don't have to do that anymore. So the four-year four term for the House to run concurrently with the president so that to some extent the people speak as to what direction that they want to go. We're interested in the environment. We're interested in worker protection. We're interested in this kind of thing. And those are the people we're choosing. And you elect a president, the whole House, and one-third of the Senate, and you have a good chance of doing that. Okay. The other one, and it, uh, again, this is something that people don't understand very well. We have got to permit some cross memberships. The old Woodrow Wilson idea of having people who have been, who, who are in the cabinet, being able to serve in the Senate, maybe the House. You know, there are different ways to do it, but there has got to be some bridge. We have no bridge at all. Now, every once in a while, just to finish this point, there's someone who says, well, we should go to the full European parliamentary systems. It's tempting. It's te and there are times when I get so frustrated, I say, let's just do it. You know, the, take, take the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and, and do it. We are a, a country of uh, over 320 million people, a very heterogeneous country, a very large country. <sighs> I'm not sure that a, that a European style parliamentary system would work here. Those are smaller countries, more homogeneous populations. So it's a, it's a different kind of thing. But this is a way to go part way to a parliamentary government. Um, if, if you want a, a, a metaphor on this, I don't know how many of you have sailed, but if you put your bow directly into the wind, you don't go anywhere. Your sail just does this, it's, it's called luffing, okay? We are going to have to admit that for some period of time, the other side might win an election and permit the kind of ideological tacking, okay, ideological tacking that gets us to where we need to go. We have been stalemated for far too long. And that stalemate, I guess, is, is the current, uh, you know, do nothing Congress, for example, where you know, it's it's a Congress of political points and, and not a whole lot of work being done on behalf of the of the American people. So that's that's an important point to make. I, I want to switch gears a little bit, though, and I want to talk in terms of economic systems. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you aware of the um, proposed plank update for economic yes. system? OK, yes. Yes, uh, I go, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, I, 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 I fully favor it. I, I have to be brutally honest with you. I have moved beyond the terms of capitalism and socialism. All right? They're important. They're important historically. We certainly don't want to forget them. But there are other ways to look at it, and there are ways to talk about the thing uh, in ways that are a little bit less jarring to the public. I'm not going to give an academic lecture here, but John Stuart Mill, contra Marx, said that the principal uh, determinant of the distributions of income and wealth are not economic in the first instance, they're cultural. The United States is a hyper-individualistic country, a, a highly competitive country. We tend to believe in winner take all. That's a cultural thing. So there are ways to talk about this that are not exclusively economic, all right? And uh, the word socialism doesn't bother me. I'm from the upper Midwest. I'm a Central European, uh, Czech and German. I knew Frank Zeidler, the last socialist mayor of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a wonderful man. And uh, we lived up in northern Illinois, and I went up there and met him one day. It was just fantastic. So socialism doesn't bother me. But there are certain regions in the country, I hope all my windows are closed, uh, <laughs> who are not quite ready for for socialism. Uh, but, you know, yes, I certainly in spirit and I'm willing to go along with that with the idea that there are other things we ought to be doing in that same area. Right. And just to help the audience out, you know, long story short, uh, we're looking on changing the, the, the definition of uh, the economic system that we would support as Greens. Um, and uh, there's a line in this in this proposal that would change the language to include that we believe the old models of capitalism and state socialism are not ecologically sound, socially just, or democratic, and that both contain built-in structures that advance injustices. Uh, instead, we're talking about large-scale public works, municipal uh, deprivatization, if I could, right. workplace, right. workplace right. and community democracy. And actually, these are not concepts that are strange to Colorado um, at all. I, I raised a couple of examples that we have here of worker-owned collaboratives, which we don't even have to talk about the word socialism, but basically these are democratically run workplaces. We have a brewery yes. here called Left Hand Brewery that's um, in, in the Fort Collins area, um, worker-owned mm -hmm. collaborative. We have another one here in Denver that's a print shop that uh, uh, is called PNL Printing, also worker-owned collaborative, both democratically run, run workplaces. and. You know, um, we don't necessarily have to go to uh, a Paris Commune sort of a situation. Absolutely, absolutely right. There are there are intermediate steps, and they're and they're out there in Colorado. I'm sure we had them in the Midwest. If you looked at a railroad called Chicago and Northwestern Railroad which has now been taken over by the Union Pacific and so forth, but it had a big badge, Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, employee owned and it was employee owned and operated. Uh, Cummins Diesel, uh, you know, the Cummins Engine Company. It's not employee owned, but the Cummins family uh, and, and that whole group that, that owned that uh, believed very much in worker participation. You have worker rotation of jobs, you have workers councils who decide what production is gonna be and so forth. And that's been around, you know, for a long time in the in the upper Midwest too. Uh, so yeah, I'm fully on board with that. I I, I really am. You know, and it's you funny, know, it's for, funny for, being, being a country, a country that's so individualistic. Uh, um, you know, we do have the know-how in these alternative systems. This is not something that's that's foreign to us, you know. Um, our, our industries, well, when we had factories and such, you know, uh, often had, I mean, e even the concept of Six Sigma, for example, the, that uh, managerial concept um, doesn't exclude worker voice. Now, you know, it's not quite exactly the worker, uh, you know, democratic workplace that we might want and that we're calling for in this platform amendment, but definitely it's, this is not something that we don't know about. No, that's true, but once again, we're a highly individualist nation, and I'm not going to be bigoted here because I've got one little strain of me that's English, but we have this, this English tradition. I mean, this is, this is more of an English country than it's anything else culturally and historically. And the English had a long, long um, period of 
evolution of notions of property and contract, okay? Property and contract. And so many people are embedded with these notions that these are really the, the uh, bedrock of our society. Why would you want to impede a contract? That's why you get the kind of arguments that you get that oppose even raising the minimum wage. That is an encumbrance on a contract. No argument. I'm for it. I think you're for it. Um, you know, most people are for it. Brothers, no, no. The, the contract is sanctioned. Uh, is, is is sanctified and if you go into Walmart and they say we're going to pay you seven dollars and 25 cents because that's the federal minimum wage take it or leave it you can't change that and I was happy to see that McDonald's did a tiny increase the other day in its wages but still let's remember something what happened to the middle class and this is something else that people can use not that long ago the three biggest employers in this country were GM AT&T and Ford, highly unionized, very well-paid workers. What are the three largest employers now? Okay, Walmart, okay, a, a holding company called Yum Foods, which is Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC, and maybe a couple other little guys, and of course, coming up in third, McDonald's, okay? Now you know the kind of workforces that those people have, all right? The, the good jobs, the manufacturing jobs, I'm from the Chicago area, I, I, I've driven all over the Rust Belt. I mean, those jobs were exported. And um, so what you have is something of an hourglass now. Pew, Pew Research, and this was just a few weeks ago, said that for the first time, the number of people in the upper class and in the lower class outnumbered the middle class. First time in the history of this country. And of course, the difference between the upper class and the lower class is pretty clear, as the upper class is very small. But still, you know, instead of the Coke bottle, you now have an hourglass. And, and that's, that's what's happened. Right. You know, and, and I'm going to pivot to another uh, topic that's actually related to our current ec economic state. Um, you know, Denver and Boulder are two municipalities here in Colorado that are among the group uh, in nationally that have passed what we call, um, you know, camping bans. And, and, and some would even say that it's a criminalization of homelessness in which if yeah. you are if you're a person that you know you, you can't uh occupy a park bench and have some sort of covering on you like a I blanket saw, or a sleeping bag I saw, isn't that unbelievable if you have a blanket or anything no you can't you can't do it well uh, the whole homelessness question is just outrageous in this country and as everybody should know if they don't know there are more empty houses than there are homeless people now some of the places should be torn down there that they're uh, it can't be repaired, but many of those homes, a little bit of work, which you could give to the people who are going to move in, it's a win-win. They have a job and then they have a house. It just hasn't been done. And let me tell you, the use of eminent domain in this country is a disgrace. It goes back to the kings of England. Everything ultimately belonged to the king, and if he needed your place for, you know, whatever. But we have had the worst abuses of it. And let me tell you a very personal story, and this isn't something I'm very happy to talk about. I'm usually very sad about it. I don't tell a lot of people, but this is so relevant. My father worked for, uh, for uh, Northwestern University. We lived right off the campus. One day, Northwestern University decided that they wanted to expand. They call a neighborhood meeting. They had their lawyers. And they said, you can fight us if you want, but we're going to win because we own Springfield. This is Illinois. And we're going to get eminent, eminent domain. I, I, it, it chokes me up. We, okay, we were a middle class family, maybe a little bit upper middle class. My father had a very good job with Northwestern University. We were thrown out of our home by Northwestern University. Okay, my family, my mother never recovered. She loved her home. She never recovered psychologically. My brother and I were both scarred by it. It was a terrible thing. You have to get out by so-and-so. We're going to use this land for something else. 
What? We were prime <laughs> homeowners. Didn't mean a thing. And that's gone on all over this country. Um, and what happens is that the, the, uh, the uh, developers, of course, pay off the politicians. And they get into the domain from the judges. You know, the ju who, who are the judges? Well, it's a politician who, uh, who uh, knew a senator, you know. <laughs> that's an old law school <laughs> phrase. So, yeah, uh, but that's, that's the kind of thing that's happened. Let me tell you something else. When Bill Clinton started to do awful things and encourage these banks to give loans that were bad loans, they were loans that had a starter percentage and then there was a balloon at the end or that percentage increased or whatever, you knew that there was something bad that was going to happen. Let me tell you something. I left the Democratic Party in 2000 for a number of reasons, although the Clintons were at the top of the list. Okay, I joined what was a bridge party here, an old civil rights party in South Carolina called the UCP, the United Citizens Party. And I joined that and we had a good mix of whites and, and blacks and mostly working class people. And in the year 2002, okay, a man by the name of Mark, Mark Whittington wanted to run for Congress. And he said he would run and so, okay, we... We voted that he should be our uh, congressional candidate. Guess what? He came to me, and I was a political science professor. He didn't know how much money he had. He didn't know anything. I said, what do you want to do more than anything? He said, I just want to help the working class in my home state of South Carolina. And I said, here's what you want to do, Mark. I'll help you. We're going to go up to the corner of Trade and Tryon Street in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're going to picket the national headquarters of the Bank of America. That's what we're going to do. Now, guess what? I have this somewhere. I'm going to show you something, because I brought this banner down. I haven't shown it to anybody in years. This is the banner that I had made and that Mark Whittington held, and there were 10 of us. We got 10 UCP people to go up and stand there. Okay, I got it upside down. Okay, South Charlotte Banks, you see it? Charlotte Banks bleed South Carolina. Okay, I made videos of it. And I ran videos and five cable stations. We got over 10% of the vote. If your folks listening in, if your folks listening in have an iPad or whatever, look up the United Citizens Party and go down to one line. In 2002, Mark Whittington ran for the second congressional district in South Carolina, got 10%, over 10% of the vote after picketing the national headquarters of the Bank of America. Now that's how conscious I was at an early, early time that this was going to hurt people, that there were going to be foreclosures, there were going to be divorces and suicides and families would be broken up. Everybody who looked at it honestly should have come to that conclusion. The Republicans and Democrats wouldn't touch it. But Whittington bought it. He thought this was a, a, a you know, really, um, you know, impactful way to show people how the banks were screwing people. And we went up there and we talked to the police captain and we got a permit and all this kind of thing. And we did it. We had South Carolina flags and that banner. And as I say, I ran the video on five cable stations and we got over 10% of the vote. Please look that up. The United Citizens Party, 2002. That, that's, that's fabulous. fabulous. Well, what do you think, what do you of, think of, of the method? The method to kind of turn eminent domain on its ear that uh, Richmond, California has been doing. Uh, uh, Gail McLaughlin was uh, was the mayor up until recently, and you know now, of course, she's on the city council. But to use eminent domain to take possession of houses that are about to go underwater and mortgage them back out at, at current market value. Tell me, I mean, what do you think of a plan like that? Well, you know, anything that can be done to save people keep them in their home, has to be done. I mean, that should be rule one. And there are so many ways that the government can help. I mean, look at, look at how irresponsible Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae were. 
in this whole thing. They were complicit, you know? You can't just <laughs> bang, uh, uh, um, um, excuse me, you can't just blame the banks, bad guys, and they did bad things, but they were encouraged by the government. They were encouraged by the Clintons to engage in that kind of a mortgage. And they got a lot of people involved, as you know, uh, proportionately a large number of African Americans. Um, I mean, th this fell on on the uh, the uh, Latinx uh, 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 community. Also, I mean, it was just one of these things where you know they really took took advantage. An awful lot of families in the black community have never recovered from what happened, and that's been over ten years ago now. Just an out, just an outrageous thing because there. Well, I say ten years. I mean, there there wasn't the crash until two thousand eight, but you could see it coming, and there were some people who were already having trouble making their payments even before two thousand eight. Right. You know, right. I, I, I was a school board member um, in, in two thousand nine, and the district that I represented was a you know a primarily Latino community, uh, working class community. And when the foreclosures and the the bad mortgages hit, you could just you could see whole blocks being hollowed out, and you would see school populations just kind of being, you know, cut down because you know the people weren't there anymore. Um, but I want to ask a, a pivot again to another question. This is this issue of, of, of peace. Um, and, and it's a preoccupation, obviously, that not just Greens have. Uh, what can the office of the president do to motivate and to ensure lasting peace? Uh, to motivate and to do what, please? I'm sorry. Uh, well, to motivate and... and move us toward lasting peace? I feel very strongly about this. Um, I may look young, but I'm not. I enlisted in the Army Reserve February 3rd, 1959, over 56 years ago, okay? My commander in chief was Dwight D. Eisenhower. Okay? At that point, we were beginning to see the very, very first inklings of the military industrial complex. They were using the Cold War, they were using the Cold War as an excuse to build empires, which have become McDonnell Douglas and Raytheon and Lockheed, and you know the names, okay? This went on for a very long time. I feel very strongly about it. I was in a psychological warfare unit, our mission, everybody has a mission, was a small Spanish-speaking island off the coast of Florida. We were under orders to never use the name of the country. Wink, wink. I think we know who we're talking about, okay? For 17 days, our unit, my unit, was frozen. Uh, we couldn't leave the area because we didn't know if the Russian ships were going to turn around, okay? I was in uniform when that happened. So I feel very strongly about that. Not only was I in the service, my great grandfather was in the Union Army. He was in the 14th Cavalry in the, uh, the state of Illinois. He was shot by the Confederates in Tennessee in 1864. I'm proud to say I'm an active member of Camp Number One, uh, Sons of Union Veterans. We are not a bunch of Yahoo right-wingers. In fact, we're quite peace-loving people because we know what our great-grandparents went through and we talk about these kinds of things. We know what war is as opposed to these chicken hawks and these neocons who don't really know. None of them ever served. I mean, that whole bunch with Bush, there none of them ever wore the uniform for a single day. And even Bush was AWOL and all that, and they, and they covered it up. And when CBS tried to expose it, you know, okay, that's how well protected the military industrial complex is. Now, let me add one thing because I don't think it's just the military industrial complex anymore. I think what's gone on in what I call, this is my title, the Abrahamic Civil War, what's gone on in the Levant is increasingly a religious war, okay? I'm not gonna get into higher academics here, 
But the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century started out as a war between Protestants and Catholics, wound up to be a war of, of nation states. Okay, in other words, the very nature of the war itself transformed during the war. We're going the exact opposite way. It used to be oil. Sure, oil is still somewhat important, but increasingly this war, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping that I'm not offending anybody here, but this war is a fight between and among Christians, Muslims, and Jews, okay? And I have come up with a little slogan. It's not very nice. Most slogans are supposed to be nice. But I am a member of the Taoist faith. You want to see my little yin-yang ring here? A, a, a religion that has a vastly superior record of peace than the Abrahamic faiths. All right? So my position is very simple on this. We don't have to choose between the Muslims, Christians, and Jews. How's that? Uh, that's, that's one of my campaign slogans, all right? And we got involved in great part because of the Israeli lobby, which includes some Jews, Zionist Jews. There's some wonderful Jews that are working for peace. I'm a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace, all right? My stepmother, still alive, is a Jew. So there's some wonderful Jews working the other side of the street, but there are far too many Jews that have gotten caught up in Zionism. And of course, the evangelical Christians are even worse. And uh, an awful lot of the tension with the Muslim world, it's not just all the bombs we dropped, although we about dropped 23,000 bombs in 2015, and Obama has bombed seven Muslim countries. But, you know, you put that aside, okay, at, at, at bottom, you have proselytizing. And there was missionary work going on with Christians in the Muslim world. Our government knew about it. Our government didn't want to do anything about it. The Muslim countries complained. We did nothing. We, we stiffed them. And so don't use just military, uh, military industrial anymore. It's military industrial religious. And uh, what you have now is, is, is is the birthing of a true religious war. And what's going on at this moment in the APAC meeting, I don't know if you, I couldn't stand watching more than three or four minutes, but I watched about three or four minutes of Hillary today. That's all I could take. You know, it was really all I could take. But I forced You're a my, braver person than I am. You know, I, I, I have to listen to this woman just so I can say that I heard some of it. it it's just appalling. And I'm going to be very bold about this. Not only do I come up with an expression that isn't very nice, but the problem that we have in this country that is exacerbating this conflict is people who have divided national loyalties. Okay? We need to repatriate the word patriotism. Take it away from the right-wing yahoos. A true patriot doesn't want us involved in these wars. The Israeli lobby does want us involved. And they were very instrumental in George Bush's uh, uh, the invasion of, of Iraq and all of that. They've been very instrumental. And I don't mean, again, to, to uh, uh, attack the Jews because the uh, evangelical Christians are every bit as bad. But if you look at the crystals and the potterets and the feasts and the frums and Elliot Abrams and all those kinds of people, these are fundamentalist Jews who are in bed with the fundamentalist Christians, and they want to convert the, uh, the Muslim heathen. And that's something that you won't find in the New York Times. You won't find it in almost all of, of, of the mainstream press, but it's there. Well, well it, it, would you would also, you also say, say that there's a profit motive to this as well? I mean, you, you have companies like uh, formerly SodaStream that were squatting on, uh, you know, Palestinian lands. And there's the issue of the, uh, you know, the colonization, the settlements that are going on and uh, that sort of thing. I mean, wouldn't you say that's an agitating factor as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is a, a mix of very bad things. And of course, again, it started with oils. Oil is still important. Um, but uh, yes, what's going on in the, uh, in, in, in the West Bank is just, it just an absolute outrage.
And I don't mean that the Palestinians were completely blameless. There was a time early on when they may have been a little more flexible and maybe some kind of uh, solution. But since Rabin was shot, uh, Israel has spiraled downhill and become a very, very different country. I had some respect for Golda Mabovich and Abba Eben. I'm old enough to remember those people. And, uh, but, you know, I think some of them really wanted peace. But, no, after, after Rabin was shot, uh, the Yahoos took over. This is a whole different population. These are people that have come in from Russia and Poland and uh, from uh, the Arab states. And uh, they have no concept of what small D democracy is. They hate Jews. They hate Americans. That You know, uh, this is getting nastier and nastier as it gets deeper and deeper. Well, all the more reason to make sure that our conflict of interest, uh, you know, trapdoors are you know, closed off. And, and you know, I, I think we can say that all Greens, whether or not they're more sympathetic um, to the situation to Israel and whether or not they might take a more hard line, um, you know, not, not only does our party stand for the existence of all of these peoples to, uh, the right for all of these peoples to exist, sure. But but APAC is is definitely an agitator in, in all of this, and no you know it it needs to be said. For example, the the, the pattern that uh, that is there in APAC in funding uh, the trips of city council members, of school board members, um, trips to Israel, and obviously show them a, a sympathetic side. You know, we also do need to state very clearly that um, the IDF are actually in the business of training our local police forces on dealing yeah. with communities of color. So, I mean, this is such an extensive problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and what they've done in the funding area is just outrageous because what they do is they come to all candidates for the Congress. You cannot run for the United States Congress without receiving a visit from APAC. Very friendly in the first visit. And if you accept their money, they're happy to give you a nice check. As soon as you win and you get into office, they will be in your office and they'll say, now here's what we need. Okay, we need some more money for the military. We need this, this and that. And we want you to keep your mouth shut about um, uh, what's going on with the wall and what's going on with uh, uh, the West Bank and uh, knocking down homes and um, knocking down olive trees. I mean, how, how awful is that? I mean, you know, to knock down somebody's livelihood. I mean, it's just been a terrible thing, and, and we've been kidnapped. And as I say, the patriotic view is a view like like mine. I'm semi-old family in this country. On my mother's side, we've been here for almost 200 years. I love this country in a way that precedes all of this nonsense where the Christians and the Jews uh, who were of a, 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 a Zionist bent were able to uh, completely hijack our government. We're entitled to make independent decisions about what is in our best interest. And I agree with you. Of course, Israel should exist peacefully with, uh, with uh, defensible borders. But that's not what's going on in the West Bank. Yeah, ab absolutely or, not. Or, or Gaza. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, we've gotten to the end of our time slot, but I want to offer you an opportunity to kind of summarize um, your view and, and kind of paint a, a vision for the future of this country. Um, and and okay, thank you. Uh, Yeah, go ahead. No, thank you very much. I'm going to start with what I have as a vision for the Green Party, and I don't know how long, much longer I'm going to last. Again, I'm almost 75. There is a contradiction on the left, and it's very pregnant in the Green Party. And that is that we have a great ambivalence about public sector power. It used to be that the progressive elements in this country use the government. Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, even, even Lyndon Johnson, if you put the Vietnamese war aside, but on, on the domestic things. A number of things happened. Vietnam, Watergate, Contopro, uh, lying and spying, okay, the outright lying about all kinds of things and spying on citizens and all this kind of thing. The left has become very, you know, very cherry about wanting governmental power. 
And that has been part of the reason. I'm not going to blame it on the Green Party because we haven't been very in influential, unfortunately. But that's part of the reason that an awful lot of people in government and in, 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 in public life were willing to let the private sector have what it, what it wanted. We as Greens have got to stand for public power so that we can withstand you know the long list, you know, the fossil fuel people, the pharmaceutical, the insurance, Wall Street, the banks, the, you know, the whole thing. They have just run roughshod over us. And our government, I hate to say this, our government is very weak. It's a very weak institution. And we are partly complicit in that. So I'm, I'm challenging the left and particularly the Green Party to come to some kind of resolution Obviously, no one wants an over-centralized, overly powerful government. We're not in any danger of that for a good long while, I assure you. We need to strengthen the government. And the kinds of things that we did here will strengthen the government, okay? The four-year term and having a legislature where there is some coordination between the executive and legislative branch, getting rid of, of the Electoral College, um, overturning Citizens United, those kinds of constitutional amendments are absolutely necessary. And, and you know, those four and then some sub-constitutional things that have to do with fair districting and uh, all, all kinds of other um, outrages that are, that are going on. There is a long, long um, list of things to do. And the, the agenda requires a strong public sector. And I say that as someone who is a pre-60s uh, figure, all right? I learned my politics in, in the late 40s and in the 50s, and I believed in, in government, and I, and I loved Adlai Stevenson, okay, and Harry Truman, and people like that. And they believed that the government could do good things. And then that kind of drifted away. Um, right. So thank you very much, Bill. Um, this is actually going to be very, very helpful for the voters of the Green Party voters in Colorado. Um, and to the people that are watching, uh, we're going to, you can look for us for this video um, and search for Green Party of Colorado. Okay. Um, and, and that's shareable. You can go back and watch the video at any point. We're also going to embed it on our website Wonderful. Um, to make to make it available. And, you know, just to let everyone know, again, our state nominating convention is going to be on April 3rd. You can go to the website at coloradogreenparty.org uh, okay. to find out the details of that. Um, we are going to have a spot to invite um, our candidates to at least um, come out, come uh, uh, virtually at least in this way to address the assembly. Um, but Dr. Bill, Colorado wishes you the best of luck in this campaign, and thank you for spending Thank you very time. much. Please consider one delegate. That's all I ask. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. You've been thank wonderful. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.